The writer to the Hebrews writes, See to it that no one misses the grace of God. What does he mean? Kyle Eidelman, lead pastor at Southeast Christian Church in his book, Grace is Greater, writes about some definitions of new words. So I'll put three words up on the screen and see if you can uh, think what the definition is before I read it to you. So the first word is phonesia. Phone, amnesia, must have something to do with that. So when I first thought about it, I thought, well, it probably means you make a call, then you put down your phone, and then you can't find your phone. But here's the definition. The act of dialing a phone number and forgetting who you were calling just as the person answers. Yeah. Disconfect. This is a great word for Halloween. Uh, the boy asked his mother if he could eat the piece of candy since he had disconfected it. Here's the definition. The attempt to sterilize a piece of candy that has been dropped on the ground by blowing on it. <laughs> Blame storming. Obviously, this has to be a takeoff on brainstorming. It's uh, probably best used in a company setting, corporate setting, any organization. Sitting in a, here's the definition, sitting in a group and discussing who's responsible for the company's problems rather than trying to solve them. So, these are words that are fascinating to us because they're new words, but they talk about something that we are familiar with. Grace is not a new word. We've heard it before, we've read about it, talked about it, and the problem with something that's familiar to us is that when we hear the word, we yawn. It's no longer amazing. The writers to the Hebrew says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. This command is followed by a warning what happens when we miss it and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. When we miss grace, a bitter root grows up. In Hebrew culture, a, a poisonous plant was known as a bitter root. Christian faith without grace is poisonous. A church without grace is poisonous. It leads to something Jesus tells us not to do. Now you'll find it in our text today, Matthew 7. If you want to follow in the Bibles that are under the seats, uh, it's going to be on page 971. Jesus says, do not judge. Now this is another one of the things I wish Jesus never said. I'm thinking, seriously? I mean, I judge all the time. I, when I meet someone, if the, you know, I judge whether they're you know, clean cut or unkept or uh, maybe by what they wear or how they talk. But Jesus says, do not judge. Uh, let's read this together. Would you stand? We'll be on the screen and read this with me. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Lord Jesus, you tell us, do not judge, but we're all guilty. We do it. Unbelievers say the number one thing that they don't like about Christians is that we are judgmental. So Lord, we don't want to be that way. Help us to know how to change. We are ready to hear. We're ready to hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
in the words we read, Jesus tells us what we're not to do and what we're to do. What we are not to do is do not judge. This happens when we miss grace. What does Jesus mean? Uh, he cannot mean, as Leo Tolstoy taught, that we're not to have uh, courts of law that pass down judgments. Nor can it mean that we make no value judgments about people and not discriminate between good and evil. We dehumanize ourselves when we deny our critical faculties the right to make evaluations. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Uh, here's an example where Jesus tells us we are to make evaluations. He says you're not to indiscriminately share the news about Christ. You're wasting your time when you share with people whose hearts are hard. It's wiser, he says, to share the gospel with people who are at least partway open. Throughout this series, Things I Wish Jesus Never Said, Jesus tells us Christians are to be different. How can we do that unless we're able to assess forms of behavior and choose the best? So Jesus doesn't mean we turn a blind eye to the faults of others. Jesus means Christians are not to be judgmental. So if you like to write in your Bible where he says, do not judge, write in, do not be judgmental. Maybe you're not a Christian. You say, yeah, that's what I hate about Christians. They're so judgmental. Jesus says we're not to miss grace. When we judge others, it often stems from comparing ourselves favorably with others. It's not that we think that we're perfect, but when we think about what other people have done that's bad, compared to ourselves, you know, it, it seems like our, 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 you know, our mistakes are not that big a deal. When we compare ourselves to others, it seems like our, our sins are no more than like jaywalking or loitering. But when we compare ourselves to others and we feel superior to them, you know what we're doing? We're sinning. In fact, in God's eyes, our act of being judgmental towards other people may be worse than the fault in other people that we're judging. I read a New York Times uh, interview with uh, former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg. He was 72 at the time, this was three years ago, and he had just uh, uh, returned from his uh, reunion with, with his uh, university, and he was lamenting how many of his classmates have died. But if he was worried about that, he didn't seem to be too concerned about what would happen on the other side. Uh, he, he, he said, you know, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm walking right in. I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I mean, with all the stuff I've done on gun control safety and uh, stopping smoking and obesity, I tell you, I have earned my way in. He, he doesn't see the need for grace. He puts what the good things he's done on a scale and he's earned his place. When we think we don't need grace, it's easy to judge, judge others who seem worse than us. Jesus gives us two reasons we're not to be judgmental. The first reason is in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The first reason we're not to be judgmental is because I hurt myself when I judge. When I judge other people harshly, they'll be harsh with me. When I'm critical of others, they'll be critical of me. Jesus tells a parable called the parable of the unforgiving servant. That one servant owes his master $150 million. He's forgiven by his master everything. He goes out and finds somebody that owes him $20. But he's not willing to forgive him. So he puts him in prison. When someone is thrown in prison, do you know who pays for him to go to prison? It's the person who wasn't forgiven. 
person he owed the money to. So not only did, in refusing to forgive, did he not get his $20 back, but he had to pay more. It's still how it works. If you refuse to forgive and keep the person who sinned against you in your prison of judgment, guess who's paying? You are. You're the one losing sleep. You're the one with your stomach all upset. You're the one who's infected all your relationships with your bitterness. Second reason Jesus instructs us not to judge is because I become a hypocrite when I judge. Why don't you read this with me, what Jesus says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye So come on up here, Cody. Uh, so Jesus is a master at using hyperbole. He exaggerates to make his point. So he says, suppose you have a plank of wood in your own eye. So, so Cody, let's say I got this, you know, I got this plank going here. Oh, Cody, you've got this spot in your eye. Let me get it out. Right? Pretty stupid, right? Thanks. That's all we need. So... Uh, <laughs> Jesus is saying, when you do that, you're a hypocrite. We're usually easier on ourselves than we are on others, right? When the other fellow takes a long time to do something, he's slow. When I take a long time to do something, I'm thorough. When the other fellow doesn't do it, he's lazy. When I take a long time to do something, I'm busy. When the other fellow does it without being told, he's overstepping his bounds. When I do go ahead and do something without being told, that's initiative. When the other fellow states his opinion strongly, he's bullheaded. When I state my opinion strongly, I'm firm. When the other fellow overlooks a few rules of etiquette, he's rude. When I skip a few rules of etiquette, I'm doing my own thing. That's the way we treat our, each other, right? Jesus tells us what we're not to do. We're not to judge. Then he tells us what we are to do. He suggests two things. First, face our sin. Instead of judging others, we're to take the plank <clears throat> out of our eye and we're to face our own eyes, or face our own sins. Apostle Paul writes, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am am the worst. If I'm honest, deep down, maybe not even all that deep, I don't think I'm the worst of sinners. I think, God, come on. I'm not as bad as the, uh, the guy in Sutherland Springs, Texas. I'm not as bad as the terrorist who mowed down people in New York City. I'm way better than the, than the shooter in Las Vegas. But the more I examine uh, my own life and know, and, and, and know who God is, I come to the conclusion that I am the worst sinner. Sometime back I had a cold. And Jory said to me, you got you to gotta get some medicine. You got to get over your cold. Every time I kiss you, I get sick. I said, oh, no, I don't have a cold. Might be allergies, you know. She rolled her eyes. Said, well, I'm telling you, if you, don't, if you don't get medicine, you don't get well, I'm not kissing you. Well, that's all I needed to call the doctor. You see, pretending I'm not sick is not a very effective way to get well. The sooner I admit my illness and get medicine, the sooner I will start feeling better. And the sooner I start feeling better, the sooner I'll be kissing my wife. Jesus says we are to face our sin, the plank in our eye. A couple years ago, I came out of the grocery store and the wind blew something into my eye. And immediately it was hurting badly. And I tried to blink, blink it out and I thought I'd maybe gotten it out. And so I crawled in my car, started driving home. But it got worse as I was driving, and it got so painful that I pulled in at uh, a Fred Meyer and went into the restroom to get it out. See, I wear contacts, and I knew if I took my contact out, I 
could probably fix the problem. At that moment, could have I seen to help somebody get something out of their eye? There's no way. I first had to get what it was in my eye out. Jesus says, face our sin. Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant. Let me read it to you. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. His point is, always show grace. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, I don't know how many bags of gold you have, but that's a lot of gold. It's just mind-boggling for us to even uh, compute how much that is. The best I can come up with, it was worth about $150 million. Now, Jesus is a master at hyperbole, exaggerate to make his point. I mean, no king would loan $150 million to somebody. And no servant could pay it back. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. This is a description of our standing before God. We've sinned. And we've racked up a debt so great that we can never pay it back. You can, we can deny it. We can dismiss it by comparing ourselves with others so our, we don't appear so bad. But no matter what we do, uh, we can never pay it back. God has seen all our sins. Your teacher may not know that you plagiarized your paper in college, but God knows. Your husband may not know about your flirting at the gym, but God knows. You can delete the history on your computer. But God knows the websites you frequent. Others may not know about your drinking problem, but God knows. The windows on your home may be shut tightly so uh, neighbors can't hear your yelling, but God hears it from heaven. The boss may not know about your stealing from the company, but God knows. God knows it all. He even knows the pride some of you are feeling right now because I couldn't think of an example that applies to you. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me and I will pay back everything. The master knows that will never happen. But amazingly, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. He doesn't extend the note. He doesn't lower the monthly payments. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. This, this man was forgiven $150 million. He goes out and finds a man who owes him $20. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. That's exactly what he asked his master. He's being asked for the same grace he received. If you've never read this story, you think, well, goodness, he was forgiven $150 million. Of course, he's going to pay him back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Now, don't overlook what happens next. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. They were outraged. Someone violates the core value of the community. If grace is the core value of the community, then that community can't just ignore when someone refuses to be gracious. Here's my concern. The church is known for showing outrage to people outside the community who need God's grace. But not showing outrage for people inside the community who refuse to give it. We need to have less fingers and more thumbs. Less pointing at other people and more pointing at our own sin, facing our own sin. 
There's a second thing Jesus tells us to do. Treat others as we want to be treated. So read this with me. This is a very famous uh, line of Jesus. So in everything... The law refers to the first five books of the Old Testament, and the prophets refers to everything else. So this is the whole Old Testament. Treat others, Jesus says, the way you want to be treated. You want to be treated with grace, so you treat other people with grace. Kyle Eidelman, in his book, Grace is Greater, tells about a pastor named Jean LaRue. And he got involved in a ministry called... Uh, Love in Action. It's a ministry to uh, people uh, caught in sexual addiction. He'd never been to one of these meetings before, but he came, and there were a lot of men there. And uh, uh, he didn't know what, how it was going to go, but one guy came to the front, and he began to talk. He said, you know, tell his story. He said, I was driving home from work, and I drove by an adult nightclub, and I wanted to stop. When a bunch of guys raised their hand, he thought, gee, that's weird. Who would ask a question in the middle of this story? And he went on, he says, and I pulled into the parking lot, and I got out and went in. And a bunch of guys raised their hand again. Then he confessed what he, what he did there. And he says, when I got done, I came out, and I was so ashamed. I felt like God could never forgive me. He could never love me. And every hand went up except, except Jean's. And he thought that was so weird. And so the director, after the meeting, came over and says, you look troubled. He said, yeah, I don't get it. Why, come, why are people, so many people asking questions while this guy's telling his story? And how come he never answered them? He says, oh, no, it's not that. We have one rule in love and action. No one struggles alone. When someone confesses their struggle, anybody else who's had the same thing raises their hand. That's what the church needs. We need people to raise their hand instead of pointing a finger. When someone else shares their struggle, they need us to say, me too. I'm broken too. So, when someone violates the core value of the community, grace, we should have outrage. Some of you have been choked by the community. You wanted to receive grace, but people didn't give it to you. So, for those of you who have grown up in a, a community that didn't show grace, I want to, on behalf of the church, apologize to you. I actually have a list here. So listen to, to the pregnant high school gal who felt judged by the fellow students in the youth group and the families in the church. I'm sorry. To the parolee who opened up about his past mistakes but was told he was no longer welcome. I'm sorry. To the woman from the adult industry who became part of the community and needed grace, but instead she was judged and had stares of judgment. I'm sorry. To the addict who was finally honest about his addiction, but instead of support was offered shame. I'm sorry. When someone in our community wants to receive grace from the master but refuses to even attempt to show it to somebody who's hurt him, the community should be outraged. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. How long is it going to take him to earn $150 million in prison? This is 
how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You push back and you say, wait a minute. Are you telling me if I don't forgive the person who hurt me, who abused me, who betrayed me, who cheated me, who abandoned me, who nearly killed me, then God won't forgive me? No, I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. Jesus said if you can't receive God's grace and then refuse to give it to others. I know it's not fair. The person hurts you. They owe you something. Maybe they owe you a childhood or a marriage or a lot of money. It's not fair to let it go. But it's grace. And you'll never be asked to give more grace than you have already received. Jesus answers Peter's equation with an equation of his own. Jesus' equation looks like this. $150 million is more than $20. In other words, the grace you have received is greater than the grace you're being asked to give. Jory and I have taught all nine of our kids to, if, if they've wronged one of their brothers or sisters, to go and say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, would you forgive me? I think all, all of our kids know how to do that and do it regularly. But it's possible that the result has led to an unbiblical view of grace. Maybe they've learned that if, some, if somebody comes to me and asks for forgiveness, then I should forgive. But that's not grace. When you make forgiving others dependent on an action the other person that has hurt you has to take, you can call it whatever you want, but it's not grace. Grace is when you forgive them regardless of what they do. I know it's not fair. But it's exactly what Jesus did for you. Are you willing to open the closet door and see if you're showing grace or judgment? You don't have to, but what's the alternative? You can continue trying to hurt him as much as he hurt you. You can continue to cons insist that she pays you back every dollar but ultimately you're the one paying the price for your refusal to forgive here's what I want to ask you to do stop thinking about what's been done to you and start thinking about what's been done for you every time the pain of what's been to you gets triggered intentionally start thinking about what God has done for you let this be your equation. For you is greater than to you. Because what's been done for you is greater than what's been done to you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your teaching that we are not to be judgmental. We're to show people grace. And Jesus, we're, forg uh, we're guilty we're so sorry. Unbelievers hate that about us, that we're judgmental. Help, we don't want to be that way. So forgive us and help us change. I want to give you a moment to pray right now. Every head bowed, like you just to pray. If you're convicted today that you're judgmental or there's somebody you can think of that you are not forgiving, you're bitter, do you want to get that off your chest right, to, right now? Tell Jesus about it. Ask him to forgive you. Ask, help him, ask for his help to help you to forgive. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you say, Jesus, come into my life. I need you to help me forgive somebody. You pray right now.
Oh, Jesus, thank you that you were not judgmental. People loved you. People that we would call sinners flocked around you because they could feel your love. We want to be that like that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.